Hello creators, how are you guys? It's great to be back for another video creators podcast episode recording done live here at youtube.com slash video creators every Monday at 2 p.m. Eastern time, 11 a.m. Pacific. And today we've got a great conversation for you guys as always, hopefully anyway. <laughs> this time it is with <laughs> Matt Geelin from Little Monster Media Co. Hey Matt, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing better than I deserve, as Dave Ramsey would say. So, yeah, doing well. Uh, I'm excited to dig into this topic with you about how to create video ideas that will grow faster on YouTube because there is no shortage of, like, people, like, you think of a unique idea and you go to YouTube and you're like, oh, that's already been done. Oh, that's already been done. Like, uh, or I, I really want to do that thing, but it's not working well and no one's like really growing do, using that or whatever. And so it's becoming increasingly more and more difficult to stand out and to find your voice and to be unique and to do something that's fresh that not a lot of other people are doing. And so you have an article coming up, which we're going to be teasing a little bit here. You guys are getting a, a, what, a sneak peek not really a sneak peek kind of like a sneak peek it's more like a sneak listen i guess there you go. and um about uh, this big article that matt has written that'll be going up uh where where people find this in the future it'll be on two filter two filter okay dot com so you guys yeah. can find it there in a little bit but for now we want to talk through it with you guys here and give you guys some ideas for how you can come up with better video ideas and things that'll just help your channel grow get help your videos grab more momentum and more views and subscribers and so we're going to dig into how to do that here today but before we dive in matt why don't you introduce yourself tell us a little about you for anyone who's never heard of you or little media or little monster media co and um, yeah, to introduce it to yourself. What's your story? Sure, absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me on. I mean, you know, I've been a fan of yours for many, many years. In fact, I got started in audience development in large part by you know reading um, what you and Mark and um, Mark other Robertson. people were, yeah, putting out on real SEO and Way back that kind of thing. Day. Oh yeah, man. Like Two thousand. Um, 12 maybe 2000 i started started doing all that stuff back in 2011 so by the time we started getting some traction it was like 2012 or 13 so it was, oh no 13 yeah. is when i started on my own so yeah anyway back a long time ago <laughs> yeah i mean i started working on the platform i would say 2008 2009 um when my brother and i were self-distributing a film that we had made um and i studied film in college and um, had a really good understanding of, you know, film and the making of media, but I didn't really understand anything about like audience development or social media, but we decided to self-distribute the film. And my brother said, Hey, you're really good with computers. Can you figure out the social media thing? Right. This was like Twitter had just started. Right. And so for like probably two years, if you searched for like film or movie on Twitter, we were like the third result. Um, so yeah, we were on MySpace, had a huge following, but anyways, the film did really well, uh, in no small part because we had this big, massive online following. And so that really made me fall in love with audience development. And, you know, I would, um, you know, go through all the channels that like next new networks operated, right? This was, uh, Vsauce and Threadbanger and Key of Awesome before it was Key of Awesome. It was, it was long, um, it's been a long time since I've heard next networks, actually. I forgot about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Next new networks was purchased. Oh, 2012, maybe, um, 2011. Um, long time ago um but uh they were purchased by youtube and eventually became the creator academy and youtube spaces and the people that worked at next new networks have all gone on to do really amazing things in the industry um but what i would do when i was teaching myself this stuff is i would look at what was working and go okay what can i take from this and apply to my own stuff uh and what don't i need so you know looking at all of that that led to a job at a company called driver digital uh, I was employee number one. Uh, I left about three and a half years later, um, and we had built up the um, the network that we had to about 100 channels, doing around 10 million monthly views, all in the mom and kids space, which 
was about two years too early. Mm-hmm. Um, if uh, you kind of pay attention to the broader industry trends, about two years later, um, you know, these kids' channels just started like cranking out hundreds of millions of views and, and that kind of thing. But um, I left uh, Driver Digital and went to Frederator Networks. Um, and at Frederator, um, Fred Seibert was the uh, one of the founders of Next New Network. So he was really big into audience development and making sure that, um, you know, everything we were doing from a programming perspective was optimized and that sort of thing. And um, we wanted to expand beyond animation. And so part of that branding effort was to write research papers and publish them on TubeFilter. Uh, and so I wrote things like the definitive guide to thumbnails and um, how you can make BuzzFeed style content and um, uh, WTF is watch time. And then right when I left Frederator, uh, I released reverse engineering the YouTube algorithm, which uh, is a much more grandiose title than Mm -hmm. um, what that paper was. Um, But essentially what that paper was, was a breakdown of the data and analytics that we use to grow the channel Frederator YouTube channel into a million sub channel in the span of about 13 months. Um, and it focused on things like average view duration and um, how frequently we posted content and um, how long the content was and yeah, how the content performed. Correct, right. Wasn't there like colors and thumbnails or was that a different post? I think that was a definitive guide to thumbnails, oh, okay. um, which was one of the first posts. But it was yellow, if I remember correctly. That was the key color to use with a yellow sunburst is, background, right? Yeah, sunburst. <laughs> the sunburst and the pinwheel, man. They'll yeah. come back, right? It's, back. It's, <laughs> that would it's be a whole other conversation to have, actually, about the, how thumbnails go through trends and what works and doesn't work on YouTube. That, I remember like Shane Dawson way back in the day. It was always a cutout with a fluorescent hot pink background. <laughs> Uh, but I digress anyway. Yeah. So, um, so you're writing all these papers and then you started a uh, little monster media co and what do you guys do now? Yeah. So we work with brands to help them build YouTube audiences. And we do that kind of in a variety of ways. Um, one of the main ways we do it is just through like consulting where we take a look at their analytics. We talk them through their analytics. We talk about what they're doing, right. What they could improve on, uh, what the data is telling us about their programming. Um, And then for some of our clients, we do production as well, which is kind of where a lot of this taxonomy of digital video came from, because at um, Frederator, which I was at Frederator for about three and a half years, um, we spent a lot of time being like, okay, what should we make for uh, our YouTube channels that we programmed? Because we programmed probably, I think, four or five channels at the time, one in animation, one in... um, uh, video games, one in movies and TV, and then like a handful of others. And so you know, I'd be in a room with 10, 15 people and we'd be pitching ideas. And, you know, a lot of the time, basically what they would be pitching would just be like, okay, well, that's just a basic listicle, right? There's thousands of them on YouTube already. Like, what are we going to do from like, adding value perspective, or you'd get an idea that might work well for like a TV audience, but just wouldn't work in the digital space. And so, you know, shortly after leaving Frederator, I sat down and spent a lot of time kind of just going through um, YouTube videos and thinking about like, okay, what's the underlying structure or purpose of this video? And how can we kind of sort them into buckets so that when we know when we're looking at a video, like, okay, this is a listicle, this is a a challenge video, this is an explainer video, and how can we use that understanding to develop content that doesn't feel like it's been done, you know, uh, a thousand times across, you know, hundreds of channels. Uh, And that's really kind of where this came from uh, as a mode of developing content. Yeah, great. Yeah, so we have a couple good people who are asking questions in the chat, and Brandon Clark, I think, sets us up pretty nicely he's like i'm not going to lie finding the next video idea is hard i never know what i'm going to do next most of the time and so what i don't think we're going to focus on is how to come up with your next video idea as much as we're going to help you come up with ways to make your current ideas perform better possibly uh and and so ideas around that but uh yeah so um you guys who have questions in the chat, I see a bunch of them 
a, b a bunch of them already. Lara's in the chat and she'll be taking your questions and putting them in front of Matt and I. So uh, Matt's going to walk us through this taxonomy of digital video and we're going to spend some time kind of d diving into this, but um, we do want to have time to answer your questions here at the end. So make sure that you're asking those and as they come up and Lara will get them for you, uh, for us, and we'll dive into those here in a little bit. But um, so tell us about... You know, you, you titled this article the taxonomy, the taxonomy of uh, digital video, and uh, it's a really long paper that you that you've written about um, what well, the ben main benefit for me that I see is like how to really make take one idea and make it bigger so it performs even better. So give us a synopsis here and uh, break it down here for us so we kind of get the the gist of the of the point of that you're making here through this paper. Sure. So the um, the idea around like a taxonomy um, kind of comes from science where they group animals or plants together based on like shared characteristics. And my thinking was you could probably do the same thing for video. And so part of this paper is the setting up of what that taxonomy might look like. And so <clears throat> for us, where we think it begins is at the vertical level. Right. And the vertical level has to do with what vertical you're making content in. For example, like automotive is a vertical, right? Like beauty and fashion is a vertical. It kind of speaks generally to what the audience interests might be. Mm -hmm. Right. But it kind of begins that like classification layer. Right. The like next step in a that vertical sports would be a vertical beauty, fashion would be a vertical family, kids, like these are all vertical. Some, sometimes I think they're kind of used interchangeably as niche or, or yeah. niche if you're American, but, yeah. uh, <laughs> but very similar in that vein. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's like a, a broad category basically. Um, and so from there, right, I think the next step in that classification model is the format of the video, right? Because if let's say you're a automotive channel, right? Uh, and you wanna make listicles, right? So you would say, okay, automotive channel that makes listicles, what style are we gonna put it in? And the vast majority of successful YouTube channels by and large uh, do direct to camera style, right? As long as we're talking about like creators, right? Um, there's definitely some, some examples of that not being the case that have done unbelievably well, but that's something that you can kind of play with, right? Well, what if you did a listicle uh, in the automotive vertical that's different in style than what, you know, the 100 other channels do? And maybe one element that you can bring in to make it feel kind of new and unique, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> From there, you have the length of the video, and that's more of just kind of like a building block thing that allows you to kind of place your content in the same context of other videos of that length. Uh, and then the kind of the next block of that taxonomy is pers personality. And I should say that this is in no way kind of like a importance chart, right? It's just um, a way of, of thinking about it. And personally, I think the, the personality on screen or the talent on screen is by far the most important thing for any um, media brand, right? I can't think of a single major media brand in the history of the world that uh, isn't built on personalities or uh, characters, right? Because <clears throat> yeah. people then, connect with people. It's not like a lot of times people are like, yeah. oh, like, let me just make this all about my logo. I'm like, right. okay, your logo is important as an icon for your brand, but people will connect to a person much better and more naturally. So, yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent. That's what we had the relationship with, right? Like, do you think, you know, Harry Potter doesn't become Harry Potter if people don't have a relationship with Harry Potter, right? The actual character, the other characters in the story that you don't feel something, right? Because that relationship is based on the emotional feeling. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, the personality layer. And then the final layer in the taxonomy as we see it, uh, and this, I think, answers, was it Brendan's question? Uh, I think so. There's a bunch of them going by. I'm trying to read as many of them as I Brandon can. Brandon or Brandon? I think, I think it was Brandon, yeah. Okay. Um, the, the final layer is the topic, right? And once you've kind of defined what those other elements are, I think just choosing the topic of your video is pretty easy. Now, um, you and I were, were speaking about this, and, and you make a fantastic point where 
um, you know, if everything is kind of set in stone and you're just choosing a new topic for a video, you could get, you know, three months, nine months, 18 months down the line and be like, dear God, I don't want to make another listicle that looks like this, that does that. Right. And you talk a lot about like, um, the, you know, having shared principles, right. Or a uh, shared interest. And yeah, I thought the way beliefs. you phrased it. Yeah. Where yeah. it's like, like my brand revolves around a belief and, and that I think that's like really helpful. Like, cause a lot of people just gotta go like, Oh, like I've seen in the chat here, some people saying, Hey, I make Fortnite videos. And I'm like, <laughs> literally, I don't know who that was. I'm not making fun of you, whoever, whatever your name was um, or is in the, in the chat. But uh, the, the, the problem of thinking that way is like, yeah, you and literally thousands and tens of thousands of other people maybe are making Fortnite videos. And so to only just make Fortnite videos is like, you're just competing. You have a lot of competition. But if you say, I love making Fortnite videos because or in order that. Or so to like, just add like the why onto it. Now that's like people understand what you do, which is the cognitive level. But now people also understand why you do it. And that's the emotional level. And that's like the first step to forming like an emotional connection with some like a viewer. And I think you really need to stay the state like what you believe and why this is important to you. Because people who share that belief with you are far more likely to actually join your channel, become a part of your community, love everything you do. Because it's not just like, oh, I don't watch him or her just because they make Fortnite videos. I watch them because they, they do Fortnite and I enjoy that. But because it's like a, a dad and a son using this as a way to grow their relationship when um, the dad is at work halfway across the country and the son's in school or something like that. Like, okay, now there's a story here. I get the, the why behind it and there's a more of an emotional connection. Uh, and so, but, but like for that example, that dad and that son, I'm making this up as I go. So hopefully this is <laughs> <laughs> that dad and that son. Um, like if, that, if that's the why is like, we, we do these videos together online because it helps us uh, grow our relationship. And then if that's why you're subscribing for it, then they have a tremendous flexibility to switch from Fortnite to a different game. Because it really wasn't about the Fortnite thing, right? It was actually about the relationship. Or they could actually maybe get together one day and do a vlog. And people will love it, right? Because mm -hmm. cause the, they have done a good job at establishing for the viewer, this is what the value of our channel is. This is what, the, what we're all about. And the why is what's going to form that emotional connection. And so I think like what you're talking about here, these, text out, these taxonomies between the vertical, the format, the style, the length, the personality, and the topic are all really important as a really good way of creatively delivering that value consistently. But if the brand revolves around the, the shared belief or the value, then you can mix any match any of these together and people will still watch. This gives you tremendous maximum freedom. Sorry. Yeah. I and there. <laughs> no, it's, it's fantastic because uh, you used a word that we use a lot. So like most of our consulting is with media companies, right? And <clears throat> what we refer to, I think, in, in kind of this exact vein is what is the value proposition of your channel? What is the value proposition of your video, right? And if the value proposition is, you know, oh, I'm going to make Fortnite games. It's like, well, what makes your Fortnite videos right. or channel proposition? Right. No. Exactly. Yeah. That's like so, a style. yeah. And like one of the things that like, if you look at, at, at some of the, the gamers that have managed to survive the inevitable downfall of the main game that they play, it's because there's a value proposition within their personality that extends beyond the interest in the game, right? There's only a handful of them. There's not a lot, right? Um, and that's where that value proposition can come into play, especially if like you're a gamer or a gaming channel. Well, that's one of the things PewDiePie did so well, in my opinion, is that it really wasn't about what video game he played. It was actually about a perceived relationship. Something is the way people felt when they were watching him play. It made he did a good job making people feel like like I'm hanging out with my best friend right now, and we're both doing something we enjoy, and uh, and it happens to be games. But so he gets people into his brand with the game, which is what they're familiar with. But then they stay because the actual value is a perceived relationship, uh, one of many. But that's you know. Yeah that's ultimately I think like a lot of these entertainment brands and creators are actually doing is uh, building a perceived relationship and that relational value can be really, really strong and really powerful when you do it well. Mm -hmm. So we, we also talk about it in the vein of like, 
that can be a little bit heady for people to understand um, from like a personal relationship level and like how that translates across screen and that sort of stuff. Um, sometimes we use the example of like, if you're really big into um, Law and Order, right? Law and Order is a procedural TV show where in every single episode, basically, uh, you know, something happens and they got to go solve the crime and like, you can like the characters, whatever is fine. Like, you turn it on because you know you're going to get this kind of like dramatic crime drama. There's going to be some kind of like main arc between the characters and it's fine, but like you, that's what you're expected to get. If you turn it on and it's a musical comedy all of a sudden, right, the, the value proposition of why you're there, the emotional response that you're going to get out of is completely different, right? My, my old boss um, used to say, be dependable but not predictable, Right. And that's kind of like one of the ways of thinking about this same concept from um, what value you're providing to the audience. Right. But even in like a show like that, um, like, for example, one of my favorite series is I'm going to date myself a little bit here is Lost. Remember the Lost series? I love Lost okay. until the last season. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. OK. So I love Lost as well. Um, but even a show as great as that only lapped in seven seasons. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, because I kind of stretched that story as far as it was going to go and <laughs> to your point. Right. And then it just kind of ended on a, you know, it was yep. like, it was okay. Yep. But, um, yeah. but I don't know how many episodes that was like a hundred something, but now we have like creators who do thousands of videos that are exactly the same and they get, and they start wondering why the audience is getting bored while well, the audience starts leaving even Hollywood and all its production value and storytelling abilities, you know, with the exception of a few, like maybe the Simpsons would be an exception. Like there's always exceptions like, like go on for decades, but most of the time, uh, even television doesn't get further than a few hundred episodes before they're like, okay, we're cutting that show and adding something else. And so I think mm -hmm. that's why it's even important for creators to think that way too. Like I could be having something that's like really awesome, but before it starts plateauing and dying, like you need to have that next thing there going. And that's why the value propositions, like that's always the same, but what you do with these, um, these verticals, formats, styles, lengths, personalities, topics, things like that can all be mix and match. So why don't you share a little bit about that with us, um, some ideas of how we can use these, how many are there, six different parts of this? Eight. Uh, oh, eight? Okay, I'm not yep. looking at the right page then. <laughs> uh, of these things. Uh, how do we, uh, how can we use them? And then I wanna dive into some uh, questions here, but give us some ideas and examples of how we could use all of this to kind of come up with new ideas that can perform better for our content. Yeah, so the, the main idea is that anyone can kind of make a base format and we get that. Um, we get what they are kind of intuitively if you've spent time on the platform, right? It's a listicle, an explainer video, a commentary video, an interview, a music video, challenges, reaction, and narrative. Um, and you can uh, read the paper that's coming out next week on two filters to kind of dive into them a bit further. But the basic conceit of it is that the people that really stand out on YouTube, the people that when you watch their stuff, you're like, man, I've never seen anything like this. What they do is they take elements from various formats and kind of blend them together uh, to make something that feels super fresh and super new. Um, and um, that's the basic concept. And so we, we try to go through and break down the formats to some of the, the main elements of those formats, the, the common uh, things that you'll see across them and be like, okay, how can we do something within this vertical, right, that doesn't feel like it's been done to death. So in gaming, right, something that's been definitely done to death is the, like the commentary video or the reaction video. Right. Um, I would say most Let's Plays are a type of commentary video where the person's kind of playing along. And, you know, you could say that there's some reaction in there where they're reacting to what's happening. But oftentimes they're just kind of talking through it. Um, is there something that you could take from a narrative or an element from the narrative format? Uh, apply that to a, um, you know, commentary format within the gaming vertical that's gonna make something feel kind of fresh and new. And I think there's some some pretty amazing examples of people who have done this, not necessarily in the gaming vertical, but um, across um, other kind of verticals. For example, Lily Singh, right? Um, now, most of the stuff she does these days is just a straight sketch, 
But every now and then she'll go back into, uh, I think, the type of video that made her um, kind of the um, uh, stand out in a big way. Now, I'm not trying to take anything away from her talent or um, you know her her comedic ability. She's a brilliant creator uh, and, and creative. So um, what I'm just trying to do is look at the type of content she's making that allows some of that to flourish. So what she would do is do a commentary video, direct to camera, which we would say is uh, a vlog, right? The type of video that marries that format to that style is basically a vlog. And you might say, okay, well, a vlog also has to, you know, discuss topics that are of personal interest and other things. But like for us, all that matters is that it's a commentary type of video, direct to camera, right? And so she starts off in that commentary format and then cuts to a sketch which is a narrative format, right? And she was one of the first people to do it, or at the very least, one of the first people to do it very successfully. And that made the content feel incredibly fresh and incredibly new. And it also set her up to be able to um, do more or less any type of video that she wanted to do on any topic. Sorry, the plumbers are here and I had to mute myself. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, I think that um, there's a lot of different things, ideas you guys could take from this. And, uh, th the problem I think that a lot of creators are going to bump into is one that, uh, at least in my experience with working with them is they tend to be so isolated in only their niche. Like the gamers only watch other gamers, the cooking channels only watch cooking channels, the dance channels only like, and they don't know what's happening with the beauty space or the vlogging space or the kid space to even be able to get ideas from them in the first place to see what they're doing and what, and what's watching, uh, or, and what they're doing on the channel. So I think, and you guys have heard me say this before, but like I think some of the one of the best things you can do as a YouTube creator is to watch YouTube videos. <laughs> you know, I know it sounds like, you know, like you want to do a face palm right now, but I, I, <laughs> it's like they said that the best authors are the ones who read the most books, and I think that some of the best creators are the ones who watch the most YouTube. And I don't just mean channels like mine and channels that you're familiar with uh, in your niche, but like one of the things we do in video labs with people is they, I force them to watch channels that they wouldn't otherwise normally watch. Like Ryan's, like adults don't usually watch Ryan's toy review. I'm like, no, you need to watch this and figure out what's happening. What are the principles that are working because they are transcendent to other channels. Uh, and so sometimes people don't even notice these principles until now they're watching Ryan's toy review. And I'm like, <laughs> and they're like, what, Tim, I want to, gouge my eyeballs out. Why are you making me watch this? You know, like, well, what's the, they're like, I can't figure out why this is valuable and why this is performing. I'm like, okay, well, same principles. Who's the target audience? Little kids. And what's the story? It's about a character who wants something, overcomes conflict to get it, and is transformed by the process, right? That's this mm -hmm. very act one, two, three of a three act structure of, of uh, that we all love, okay? There's a kid who wants something in a box. <laughs> the box mm -hmm. presents a challenge to him. He wants to open it, and he is, he is transformed when he finally gets that toy out, right? Like, it's the same principles that apply to everything else, everything else but like we just yeah. miss it when we just kind of become so tunnel visioned in our own vertical own niche and things so you guys do need to watch a lot of youtube and if you haven't watched a dance channel before watch dance videos if you haven't watched cooking videos watch that if you haven't and kind of um yeah if you haven't watched vlogs or games like go watch it you don't have this watch it forever but just watch yeah. some for the educational value and pay attention to what's working here what's not working here yeah you're not watching it for entertainment you're watching it to study it yeah, right. sometimes you're like, and you like think the opposite of entertainment. Do <laughs> you know, you're like, do I have to keep watching this, Tim? Like in video labs, I'm like, yes, you have to keep watching this because there's some good stuff in here. And they're mm -hmm. like, oh. So, yeah. Um, so you guys need to branch out and, um, and, and start. So you have ideas of how do you combine challenges with reactions and music videos with, with reactions and listicles with explainers. I'm just going through your paper here. Commentary with, uh, with, narrative what else do you have here um just yeah it's just like how do you how do you put all these different types of genres together in a way that could be something new and something fresh and unique and the only way you're gonna get those ideas is by maybe reading the paper when it comes out but also by just watching a ton of youtube and seeing what other people are doing so yeah i i think the the paper is a good um starting point for a lot of people to give them a framework in which to think 
right? That's really all we're trying to do with this paper, like from like a tactical point of view, um, is be like, okay, here's a way to think about YouTube content that you can apply to making your own videos. Yeah, absolutely. Let's dive into some of your questions here, guys. So thank you for the super chat. Smart uh, smart drive test. Really appreciate that. It says, turned over 90,000 subs yesterday. Thank you, Tim, for your help and suggestions to my channel. Looking forward to getting to know your stuff, Matt. So congratulations, man. 90K. Hey. That's awesome. Love it. Okay, so this is a common type of creator question. I, I don't want to get in the weeds here, but it's um, spatastic. Ask, how do we know if the idea will be good or do decent in the algorithm in advance? Okay, so the the temptation here, for, and this is where the question is going, is like go like all into the weeds of the algorithm, and Matt has plenty of papers about that <laughs> kind of stuff. But um, Matt, how would you like summarize that in a way that like like mm -hmm. where like where they put twenty percent of their effort, they're gonna get eighty percent of the results. Yeah, well, what I would say is that the the algorithm doesn't know what format your video is in, and I don't think it cares um, one way or another. The, the idea behind, okay, we know these formats work, is that it's going to be understandable to an audience, right? Like um, in film school, we looked at stuff like, uh, I think it was like dogma, 54 films or whatever and there was this very certain set of rules for dogma films and you know we looked at you know um salvador dali's uh first film that was like a um god what was uh, he wasn't an impressionist he was an abstract um painter whatever it was kind of crazy but like the basic idea is that um, what these formats allow you to do is to make something that's going to be understandable to an audience, but not feel tired and done, right? Like there were a bunch of, um, you know, uh, uh, sitcoms that were advertised in the Super Bowl last night. And I said, dear God, who watches this stuff anymore? Like you've got like the most amazing, you know, TV and film ever made. It's all over the place. Like who's turning, tuning in to watch these sitcoms? And my brother turned to me and was like millions and millions of people, right? It was just one of these reminders of like, it's something that is just so easily understandable to so many millions of people that it's, it's comforting. It's fine for them to watch, right? It's not anything that's going to challenge them, but it's, it's familiar, Right. And the idea is that if you can make uh, formats that feel familiar, but aren't like on the nose, you know, here's the top 100 facts about X, Y, Z. Right. Like that's, that's so on the nose listicle that people are gonna be like, yeah, 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 I've seen this before. I don't I don't need it. But if you're able to kind of bury that listicle in the same way that like dude, perfect, dude, perfect is a listicle. Right. It's Tell a bunch of other things. Yeah too but it's it's a listicle yeah. right like what's the difference between ping pong trick shots and 45 ping pong trick shots the difference is about i think you know 40 million views of video in in no small part i mean what they do is amazing right but like it's a listicle right and so like um the the idea is that when people watch it and they or they click on it and they watch it they're they're enthralled by it and it feels fresh and it feels new and unique so they continue to watch the video throughout right and if you want to like talk about algorithm and that kind of stuff like the basic idea is that what this does is it helps extend your watch time by making something or your average view duration of a video by making something that feels fresh and new and unique yeah I think the part about the question is like, how do I know if the idea will be good in advance? And oh. I think the way you learn that in advance is just by doing it over and over. Like there's no shortcut, like guys, like you got to make a hundred videos, a 200, 300, maybe like whatever it takes and careful evaluation of the data, right? So it's not just like you're repeating the same mistakes a hundred times, that won't get you anywhere. But it's like <laughs> you make a video and then you analyze your audience retention graphs and you analyze the click-through rates of your thumbnails and you and the titles that gain traction and how you're connecting the title and thumbnail to the opening seconds or not and purpose, right? whatever, of your video so that you're, you're learning how does my content, which is hopefully unique from anyone else's out there, 
what does it take to make this content perform well? And it looks on the outside like it's just a lot of fun and games by hanging out and doing, you know, literal maybe just games. But what you don't see behind the scenes of a lot of these successful creators is how much they're just actually rinsing and repeating and learning each time and then iterating as they go. So yeah. eventually you get to the point you're like, I know this is going to work. Because like for me, every time I do a video about how to get more views, money, and subscribers, people click and watch, right? Yeah. Well, I'm a little yep. tired of doing that, so I'm going a little bit of a different direction <laughs> as we've talked <laughs> about here before. But that's uh, like you just start to know how, how, yeah. what they want I, to do it. I can give you an example from the, the little monster channel I just launched. Um, I think we have four videos up. <clears throat> the three of them are like... Um, cut downs of one hour channel strategy consulting sessions, right? And I think I did one at like an hour, one is 45 minutes and like one is 30 minutes. And I'm not going to do those anymore because looking at the data, it's clear to me like sitting through a 45, 30 to 45 minute video talking about like in-depth analytics and YouTube strategies just isn't going to be super exciting to a large number of creators and people right. I wanna help even if there's a ton of valuable information. I could have given you that shortcut. I did that a while back. <laughs> Although your channel is different than mine, so it might have, you know, it was probably still worth the experiment. Yeah. But yeah, well, we're like, still gonna we're still gonna do those because I think people love looking at the analytics. But what I'm gonna do is turn that into like a 10 or 15 minute video of me just going through their analytics and talking about what I'm seeing. I think it's gonna yeah. be far more palatable and interesting to people. Yeah, cool. Thank you for the super chat, Blackstone Intelligence Network. It says, I quietly, I've quietly watched your videos on and off for five years. I like getting helpful tips from someone with good family values. I'm up to 213K subs. Thanks. You're welcome. Congratulations, man, on the success. On the success. And I'm glad you've been able to pull that off. 213,000 is no small feat. So congratulations to you, man. Um, Afshin Vlogs. If, our, if your YouTube channel is, let's say, in the people category, if any of our other videos are in a different category, can we add that video to in other category? Is that bad for the channel? So I think what they're asking is, is it okay to switch verticals? And is it like okay to try new things? Is that going to be bad for our channel? Oh, I think he's, um, the way you phrase his question is better, but I think he was specifically talking about like the designation in YouTube where it's mm -hmm. like film and animation. Oh, people like the in actual <laughs> category setting? Yeah. Yeah. Generally me. speaking, I don't think the category matters at all and hasn't no. for like seven yeah, years or so. Yeah. It's actually, um, they keep pushing it back. They went from like prominent, like under tags and now it's like under advanced and I'm just waiting for it to disappear completely. <laughs> but So if that's your question, no, it doesn't make any difference. If my question is like, uh, I think you have to experiment and try new things, keep your content fresh or your channel will eventually die. You know, uh, maybe not right away, but I think you gotta keep keep it interesting for yourself as a creator and for your audience. Uh, um, girls, oh, go ahead. So I, I, just, I just wanted to touch on that for a second. Um, generally speaking, um, you know, it was, um, do you follow um, Benji Travis and Sean uh, Cannell? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Cannell, sorry about that. Um, so I actually just read their, their book and um, one of the great things about like reading this sort of stuff is that it kind of like refreshes stuff in your memory and you're like, yeah, of course. Like, you know, and you're like, I, I actually went and changed stuff on my YouTube channel as a result of um, reading the book because I was like, yeah, come on, of course you know that, like right. great reminder, that sort of stuff. There's a lot of good stuff in there, but um, you know, they talk a lot about like creating a community, right? And if you've created a, a community around a shared common interest, right? Like broadly, like if you go from being an automotive channel to a beauty uh, vlogging channel, right? Like you're gonna lose a lot of fans and that sort of stuff um, if you're talking about a different shared common interest. But I think, if you have that same kind of shared common interest and that is one of the through lines within your, your audience, then you're going to be perfectly fine. But I would be very careful not to on the same channel. Like if I have a channel that just talks about anime, like I'm not going to go on that channel and talk about, um, you know, a heavy romantic drama. Right. It's got the value proposition has to always stay the same, but the style and the format in which you deliver the value can change. So, for example, so, I'm used to doing like these just sit down teaching videos. Um, but uh, the value proposition about how, teaching you guys to master YouTube so you can spread a message that reaches people and changes their lives. So I actually have a whole narrative series coming up called Creator Stories that I'm putting a lot of work into. I've actually been working on it for 
about nine months now. And um, that'll be more of like a short film type of uh, like reality show type of feel. And that's a completely different style and format that I've ever done before. But you'll hopefully still watch because it's still presenting the value to you that you want. Because at the end, you'll be like, oh, now I not only understand what I have to do on my channel, but now I'm actually going to go do it because I heard the story. I understand about like what's at stake if I don't. Right. Girls Play Dolls says, to Tim's point about series fizzling out and audience losing interest, is there a certain amount of time that it's best to change things up on YouTube, like every month, once a year? I, I think there's a couple factors to consider. One is your own creative energy. You know, are you just kind of like, I'm just kind of bored of this? Like, then yes, change it up for yourself. Two is like, well, what's not, what's not really performing very well, you know, anymore? Like, maybe it used to perform well, but it's not anymore. Three, what are other people doing in your niche that uh, looks like it's kind of maybe the direction where this niche is going and that this looks like it's the thing that's performing better now instead. Um, and uh, number four, I think there's just always like find new ways and fresh ways to kind of do it. Like that's like an ongoing thing. I think as soon as you start getting into a rut, especially if you start getting into that for a few months to a year, that things will just kind of there's a lot for you and your channel. So I think it's always, you know, about pushing yourself. When I, when I think of some of the creators now or that used to be huge and no longer are, uh, some of them are losing hundreds of subscribers, thousands of subscribers a day, even though they were at three, four, five, six million subscribers back when, you know, back just a few years ago. I look at their content and I'm like, I feel like I'm still watching the same video that I watched back in 2008 or 2011 or whatever, like nothing's changed. It's still the exact same thing. And I, th I think you, you know, after a few years, you definitely got to change it up. But um, I think maybe developing an expectation on your channel that the value is always going to be delivered, but whether it's going to be a overtime video where it's like a sit down show on do perfect, or it's going to be a trick shot video. I don't really care because the value is the same, even though the format is changed and do perfect is always kind of coming up with new formats and new ideas and experimenting with them. So I'm kind of ranting right now, but that's, um, hopefully that helps uh, on that one. And let's wrap up with this last one. The Bard, when trying new content, how long should you try it before deciding if it works on a channel or not? It's a good one. Matt, um, I have an idea, but I'll let you go first. <laughs> So generally speaking, um, we like to do at least a minimum of three to 10. Um, it's, it's all about like reading the data and it's all relative to the size of your audience uh, and the potential for it and how much you like doing it um, versus uh, how underperforming against your other content it is. Um, it's kind of hard to say out of context, but I would say somewhere in the range of like three to 10. Uh, and if the slope is downward, then it's got to either go on its own channel or just stop being done. Uh, if the slope is upward, then you might want to keep hammering away at it. I do something very similar. I'll do around eight to 10 uh, because if you just do it once or twice or even three times, it's like, it's hard to evaluate because your audience isn't used to it yet. It's something new for them. It's new for you. You haven't quite figured out how to do that style maybe very well yet. And so I'll do about uh, eight to 10, I usually do around 10. And then what I'll do is I'll put them in a group in my analytics and I'll knock out the top performing video and the bottom performing video out of the group because you know, Oh, that video got shared by so-and-so. So it's not like a fair a comparison anymore. Um, and so I'll have like a group of like, for example, when I was this past year, I, one of the experiments I did is how do videos in front of my black screen versus on this couch versus in my backyard versus walk and talks. How do all those are like different groups in my analytics. And then I use the comparison tool just to overlay them and see like, Oh, on average, a walk and talk is 10% more audience retention and watch time than, uh, sitting on my couch, for example, right now, it's, it's still not a great comparison because you know some of them might have to do with the topics I talked about too and other things. So, but at least it gives me like an idea of am I at least heading down the right direction with this type of style? And I think even looking at the, um, in groups in analytics classic is a little bit hard to figure this out, but going forward into beta studio groups, there have uh, well. They don't have it yet, but they will have some features <laughs> that will make I think make you just it. broke some news. I, I did not. Are we uh, getting groups in beta? I, Tim, do you have secret knowledge? Groups are already in beta. 
So I can't access them. Oh, they're there. They're already there. Where? Yeah, I'll, I'll show you afterwards. Um, but okay. uh, yes, you can always create groups in beta, but um, the part that's not coming, I saw this on Creator Studio, so this is not an NDA thing. Um, okay. Or not Creator Studio, um, Creator Insider, that channel, is... Um, that then they'll be able to compare and be like, okay, here's these two groups and here's how these, this videos performed in the first 48 hours in this group versus that group. So you'll be able to do a better comparison of like, not just overall what happened, but like more of like these videos perform like this in the first 24 or 48 hours, these like this. Um, and you'll be able to break it down so you can kind of like see a little bit better how one video gained traction over what period of time versus another. So, uh, that part I have not seen yet, but I am definitely excited and looking forward to that one. So that's awesome. Great. Cool. Well, Matt, if people want to find out more about you and what you do, where would they go? Uh, they can go to our YouTube channel, um, that we just launched. Um, it's, uh, a string of letters and numbers, but if you search for uh, little monster media co or me, it should, should come up. Sweet. Um, or they can follow me on Twitter at Matt Gielen or littlemonstermediaco.com. Cool. Sweet, guys. And yeah. um, appreciate you hanging out with us, Matt, and the rest of you guys. Thank you for having me. I don't have another live stream scheduled. Um, you guys who are in the in – the, I used to call them the podience, but people stop <laughs> – People, yeah, they, that's their reaction. They kind of do an eye roll. <laughs> and uh, some people love it. Like some people are like, it's such a good term of endearment. And other people are like, cut that out. That's unprofessional. <laughs> and it's somewhat insulting. It sounds like you're saying potty. But um, uh, you guys will get, be, keep getting new episodes every every Tuesday. So, you know, nothing's changing for you guys. But um, in, in terms of doing a test and having to change our content based on what we find in the analytics, I found in my channel, anyway, this isn't true for everyone's channel, by the way, just for what I found in mine is that um, the goal that I'm trying to accomplish with these live streams isn't necessarily being reached. And so uh, I might continue to do them here, but if so, they will just become unlisted afterwards and not go to subscribers and it'll just be something for us here to enjoy privately in a live stream and then afterwards you guys don't get access to the replay unless you listen to the podcast later so still have to make a decision about that but just, you know as of right now there's not one scheduled for next week but uh we will be in touch and uh you'll you'll, you'll find out if something happens next week or not as i do <laughs> so how's that for a setup <laughs> yeah. perfect oh great well thanks for hanging out guys check out matt and um we will catch up with you guys on the on the podcast again next week and if you're not subscribed to the podcast or you're here in the live stream you can check it on itunes soundcloud stitcher google play spotify wherever you listen to podcasts we're there and subscribe to our podcast there and we will continue to hang out with you guys every tuesday then and then you can listen on double speed and not real time and get it in half the speed mm -hmm. half the time, which is what i do so thanks for hanging out and we'll catch you guys later bye